Today's episode is brought to you by Cloisonne, one of the world's fastest growing network marketing companies. With our life-changing products and our revolutionary Try It For Free It's On Me campaign, we are changing how people make money from home. So if you're interested in helping people improve their health and their wealth by giving away products for free, then visit cloisonne.com. That's C-L-O-I-X-O-N-N-E.com. Cloisonne's easy as one, two, three system is helping the average everyday person earn a significant income just by showing others how to give away life-changing products for free. So visit cloisonne.com. That's C-L-O-I-X-O-N-N-E.com. Start changing your own health and your own wealth today. All right. Well, welcome to another edition of the Alden Report. My name is Michael Alden. We are here in Blue Bay Studios, and I always start out with saying how excited I am uh, for, for, for what I'm able to do and, and the people I'm, who I'm able to talk to. And, and I am super excited to have my, my next two guests. I think this might be the first time we've had two guests on uh, at the same time, but we're going to do something a little bit different today. We're going to talk about the publishing world. We're going to talk about what it takes to publish a book, what does it take to write a book, and then the other part that I've learned kind of the hard way, uh, what it takes to market a book and, and all these different things. You know, so many people uh, are, are always talk about they want to write a book or they might have a book in them. Well, these next two guys uh, that I have on today are experts within the field of writing books. My first guest is Naren Ariel. Ariel, excuse me, Naren Ariel. He is the CEO and founder of, of an organization of a publishing company called Mascot Publishing. He's also the author of, of his book. We're going to talk about it uh, called How to Sell a Crap Load of books and that's an interesting title uh, and and my next guest is uh, with him as well as his partner is Tim Vandehey. Tim is a is is an author himself he's a ghostwriter he's a copywriter he's doing a lot of different things he's a he's a dad um, and and he's written probably close to I think the last time I looked over 50 books and, and ghostwritten some books and some of them have gone on to become bestsellers so we're going to talk to them again about what it really takes to become a uh, to become a published author and maybe some of the goals that you may have why you want to write a book why is it important uh in things like this so guys thanks for thanks for being my guests guests plural well thanks for having us on it's a pleasure hey mike happy so, to be here so so why don't we start with uh with you uh Naren. so tell us uh quickly uh about <laughs> i say quickly tell, tell us a little bit about your background um you, you have an interesting background you, like me where we are both recovering attorneys um tell us how you got involved uh in the world of publishing books yeah, sure. So uh, I was a practicing attorney and uh, working with venture-funded startups in Northern Virginia. And I was with two or three, uh, each looked promising, each um, uh, didn't end up promising. And I was uh, taking a break. And at that time, we were down at a football game at my alma mater, Virginia Tech. And my daughter, Anna, shout out to Anna, uh, wanted a children's book about the Hokey Bird, Hokey Bird being the mascot at uh, Virginia Tech, of course, and uh, not finding such a book, um, my wife and I wrote a simple little children's book called Hello, Hokey Bird on the Ride Home. And what <laughs> we found is my daughter, um, being a fan of the mascot, really enjoyed this uh, the story. And we put some doodles to it. And, um, and, and, you know, I decided if my daughter enjoys it, I'm sure there's a lot of other families that would enjoy something similar. So we self-published a book called Hello, Hokey Bird. And one day, 5,000 copies showed up at my door. It was a very happy day, as you can imagine. But it, shortly thereafter, I decided, wow, this is scary. I don't know anything about selling books. Um, so that was how we got into the world of publishing. And shortly thereafter, we had books for just about every major college, professional sports teams, um, children's books that were licensed by these entities. And we entered the world, the crazy world of publishing, on the backs of brands that people know and recognize so it really did take a take the risk out of the world of publishing and since that uh, time you know we've obviously gone on to uh, uh, diversify we're a multi-genre publishing company today we do a lot of business books um, we still do a lot of uh, uh, children's books as uh, as my as the esteemed host here um, can attest um, we're working on a book together with your daughter um, but we do a little bit of everything fiction nonfiction cookbooks coffee table books um, we're a bona fide uh, middle-sized publishing company, which is a rarity, and we're located outside of Washington, D.C., um, and we're working on some really cool things. 
I love it. We're going to talk a little bit more about your experience, obviously, throughout the podcast. And then, and then Tim, tell us a, a little bit about your background. How, how did you, you know, go from uh, first kind of being a copywriter to now being a ghostwriter and being able to, to do such an amazing job of telling other people's stories? Well, uh, I got my, uh, my journalism degree out in California where I spent most of my life and um, you know, worked at the ad agency thing, the magazine thing for a while and got tired of that and uh, went freelance uh, what, almost 22 years ago now writing advertising. And one day one of my clients said, hey, Tim, could you write a book for me? And I said, sure. And then I hung up and went, oh, God, how do I write a book? Because you know, <laughs> but that's what you do. You say yes, and then you figure out how to make it happen. So I wrote a book, and it was terrible, um, which first things of anything usually are. Um, thing is, I wrote three more books for the same guy because he liked it, and I, I didn't care for it, but he worked for him. Um, you know, he had it as a sort of a brand builder for his his marketing agency. The third, the fourth one, sorry, that we wrote was called the brand called You. Um, did extremely well. Got great reviews. Sold a lot of copies. Um, hit the bestseller list over in Asia. This was all self published, and this was back in two thousand and three. And that book got me a lot of attention, got me an agent, um, and I got a lot of people coming to me saying, hey, could you write my book too? So that's sort of where the ghosting thing started. Um, it's about 2004 and five, it really caught fire. 2006, I started writing books exclusively and stopped doing the copywriting uh, business. And so since then, yeah, I've worked with you know, celebrities, athletes, CEOs, um, written more than 50 books, like you said, uh, had a couple of New York Times bestsellers, and I've got five, pot, I guess really including, yeah, I guess six books coming out in 2017, so wow. it's, a, it's a busy year. So I want to I want to start with you, Tim, and, and, and ask you, um, you know, the, the whole the, the whole ghost writing thing. See, I, I've written, you know, three or four books now and, uh, you know, I've gone through the editing process and, I, and I, I was able to, you know, to write them myself, you know, word for word. And it's, and man, it, I'm not an author by trade, right? And it, it was uh, uh, a, a very, very difficult task. Uh, I'm glad I did it. But for some, some people who don't have maybe the time to do it, um, and, or maybe they're just nervous about it, why, why would someone choose a ghost writer versus writing it themselves? Well, I can tell you the, the, the top three reasons. I mean, I, you know, the, the people that I primarily you know, ghost for are very busy, very successful professionals. You know, they're CEOs, they're entrepreneurs, um, they're celebrities, uh, they might be attorneys or, or college professors or doctors. So they're people with very busy careers, consultants, coaches, etc., uh, running companies, things like that. And they want something to, sh they want to share their story. A lot of times they want to build their brand. Um, either because they want to um, increase the visibility of their business or their consulting practice, or they want to do something. They want to have a platform to do something once they leave the job they're in now. Say they've been a, you know, a doctor for uh, for 25 years and they're getting tired of practicing medicine, or they're looking at retirement and thinking, well, I want to go on the speaking circuit, and I need a book, which is you know a pretty valuable thing to have when you're a speaker. And so a lot of those people, um, they they there's either one 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 or all of three factors involved. Um, they don't have the time to write a book, which frequently, you know, they're running the, they're running a, a busy business that takes up all of their time that they're not spending with their families. Um, they don't have the writing chops to do it, which is pretty pretty common. Um, they might do some writing um, in some small ways, but in terms of writing a book that could get you know, picked up by a, a New York publisher, for instance, they don't have that level of writing chops because they, which they, there's no, there's nothing to be ashamed of about that. They're not professional writers. How do you know? How, how do you know that part? Because because that that's that's a part I think a lot of people uh, misstep. You, there are so we'll talk about the self publishing world obviously uh, in, in a few minutes, but you know there are so many people out there that think they're great authors and they put together a book and then they push it out and. It's 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 subpar is, is being nice. How, how do you how do you know that it's that you that you don't have the chops? Well, I tell when I, when I get that question from, and I typically get that question from people who have been. See, one of the things that makes it challenging makes books books challenging and writing challenging for a lot of the folks I work with is they've crushed everything else they've ever tried to do in their professional lives. Right. Started companies. They've built them into billion dollar company, you know, billion dollar concerns. They have been successful at everything, and then they come up against this writing thing. And they're sort of taken aback by, by how not good at it they are, how hard it is. So what I tell them, if they question me, they ask me that question, I say, go and publish. 
Go on LinkedIn Pulse and start there. If you can get something picked up by Fast Company or you know Forbes, Forbes does a ton of um, about of uh, third party columns where you can do you you can just publish on their website um, and see if you can get your stuff picked up and see what the response to it is. Go write some stuff on LinkedIn Pulse or, or Forbes or some blog guest blogging things like that and see what the response is to what you write and get some critical some critical feedback from people who are not just going to tell you what you want to hear. And you'll know pretty quickly, especially from the professional outlets like a Forbes or a Business Week or something like that. If they're interested in your stuff, it's probably decently written. If they're not, then you may have to, you know, eat some crow and say, okay, maybe I don't have the chops for this. That's that's really the only. I I, I, I tell people to assume the default is that they, you know, that they might be decent writers, but if they really want to do a book that's going to move the needle for their business or their career. Um, they should assume that they need a, need professional help. I don't mean that in a psychology way, but sometimes, <laughs> they, sometimes they need that too. Um, but you know, it's 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 naive to think that somebody can spend twenty five years in venture capital or building uh, building a public company and also have the writing chops to get on the New York Times bestseller list. That's just not realistic. So I I, I just tell them you know when in doubt get get professional assistance. Yeah, no, I think I think that's sound advice. You know, when I when I wrote my first book, it was for me, it was uh, it was it took a lot. Writing the book was one thing, and then the next part was when, when I when when my publisher said, "Yeah, we'll, we'll take it." Uh, I got back a twenty five page proposal that said, "We'll take your book, but we basically want you to rewrite the whole thing." <laughs> and, and for me, that was that was uh, it was somewhat bitter bittersweet. Um, but yeah, I think I think that's uh, sound advice. Uh, so, Naren, so. I'm, I'm sorry, Tim. Will you say something else? It's not, it can be humbling. Yeah, no, it, it was def- definitely humbling. Uh, now, now, you know, Tim had mentioned something that that for me is is uh, is has eluded me uh, with my first uh, two books, and hopefully, we'll hit with the children's book that you mentioned uh, uh, that we I actually published through your company, Mascot Publishing, um, the New York Times. Um, t- t- talk to us a little bit about. Uh, what it means to hit the New York Times and what it takes to hit the New York Times, because Tim, you know, was talking about creating great content, a book that that uh, that is published publishable and and has you know, uh, you know, decent literary flow. But getting on the New York Times, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a great book, right? What what does it really take to get on the New York Times? Yeah. So first of all, you know, uh, we all hear the term best-selling author. Um, and it's thrown around uh, quite a bit. And so there are a, are a lot of lists out there. And, uh, for example, Amazon, of course, uh, PW, uh, uh, and, and others. But the New York Times is the toughest list to crack. And so what authors, and I've got to explain this to authors all the time, um, there are book sales that count toward uh, such a ranking and book sales that don't count toward such a ranking. Um, so if for example, you're going to have a book launch and you're going to invite 500 of your closest friends and they're going to buy books at your book launch at some uh, venue, maybe your home. Um, it's great to sell 500 books, but those don't count. Um, what counts is are, are the entities that report into the New York Times. So that's something that we always have to let um, our authors know right up front. And if it is, in fact, impor- important for you and your book to um, to take a shot at the New York Times, which is you know by all accounts the uh, the most prestigious um, uh, book selling uh, ranking out there. Um, you got to first of all have a lot of sales to count, and it's kind of a mysterious um, formula that isn't um, plain uh, and clearly understood. Um, you know, it, it has to do with how many books you sell in the pre-release um, section segment of your launch and actually just post-release as well. And so that n- number varies uh, given the week and what's going on and who you're competing against. Um, and I'd, I'd welcome you guys to chime in here, but generally um, what I've heard is it's, it's probably about 10,000 books a week, but that is a sliding scale based on what else is going on at the time and who's yeah, releasing yeah. books. Yeah, it depends on the list. I'll, I'll, I'll chime in if I, if I might. Michael, um, you know, when I, I had a book that I ghosted that came out in 2000, February of last year called The Weight, W-A-I-T, and it debuted at number nine on the, there's also a different list, by the way, so the New York Times has a, a nonfiction how-to and advice book list that's just, you know, self-help books and things like that. And this book debuted at number nine on that list by selling about 6,000 books. 
uh, about 3,000 in pre-sale, meaning orders, you know, that, that uh, hit before the book actually officially came out, and then 3,000 that first week. So that gives you an idea. You know, you want to debut in the middle of the list. It's a, it's a 15 deep list. We debuted at number nine. It took 6,000 books, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it is. So it's hard. Selling that many books is very tough. Yeah, that's one of the big, um, big things we hear from authors all the time. Hey, 10,000 books. How tough could that be? <laughs> <laughs> and we have a conversation. That can be very difficult. Yeah, yeah, absolutely can. You know, folks, we were actually on with Naren Ariel and Tim Vandehey. They are they are the, the co-founders. We're going to talk a little bit about their organization called Beast Sellers. They also have written a book. Uh, I love the title, How to Sell a Crap Load of Books. And, and the reason why they're on is because, they, again, we have a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of business people that listen to this podcast. And everyone always says, hey, Mike, I, I'd like to write. I have people come to me all the time and say, Mike, I'd like to write a book or or, or, or I'm writing a book. And I say, well, great, you know, send me, send me the manuscript. Manuscript, and not one person has ever sent me their manuscript because I think that it becomes an overwhelming, daunting task. These guys over at Beast Sellers um, can show you how to do it. And, and for me, uh, as someone who has written two books, who has hit USA Today and the Wall Street Journal, number one on Amazon, and missed that e- elusive list of the New York Times, we'll spend a little bit more time about that. Teaming up with with people that really understand this industry is something that I learned probably the hard way. Uh, after my first book, I thought because I owned a marketing company that I could go out and, and sell a bunch of books like we were just talking about. There is a science to it. It's not a perfect science, but it's a lot different than you know selling uh, you know dietary supplements like I do or selling you know widgets or what have you. The publishing world is changing and how you sell things is changing. So if you want some more information about Naren and Tim, you can just go to Beast Sell. Com. You can also find their book on Amazon, How to Sell a Crap Load of Books. And they're going to give you, you know, all the, the secrets really inside that book on, on, what, on what you need to do from, from writing the book to maybe even considering having it ghostwritten to also, for me, I think, which is the most important part after you're done, and they talk about this on their website, is then marketing the book. So, guys, um, you know, back to the New York Times again. For me, when you talk about the different, it, it's crazy. You talk about these numbers. I mean, I sold 17,000 copies week one on 5% more, and we didn't hit the list. And Ask More, Get More, I was number two on Wall Street Journal uh, uh, when we debuted with Ask More, Get More. Uh, and then when you looked at the New York Times, I was ahead of everyone on the New York Times bestseller list. Right versus the Wall Street Journal, and I didn't make the uh, the, New York, the New York Times. So. Um, I've been told that there's this editorial discretion as, as well uh, involved over at uh, at the New York Times. Can you can any one of you elaborate on that? Have you heard anything to that effect? Yeah, I certainly have, it's Tim. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've definitely we we, we all, we've all heard rumors, some you know less believable than others, some more believable that there is a lot of editorial discretion, that there's a lot of um, selective reporting or selective acceptance of reporting of copies sold, depending on the publisher. That there's a bias toward books from the big five, you know, Harper Collins and Simon and Schuster and Macmillan, Penguin, Random House, and Hachette, the big five you know, publishing houses. There's a bias towards those books, which I tend to believe, based on the, the list, you know, the list as it's uh, as I've seen it over the years. So yeah, I, you know, the New York Times is the one everybody wants to be on. It's it's sort of the the fetish object, you know. It's like oh, the new validation, ultimate validation is to be on the New York Times list. But let's face it. A bestseller list uh, ranking is just a snapshot in time. Now it's helpful, no question, it's helpful. Um, but there are other lists that I that are, I think, fairer. You know, publish the Publishers Weekly list. Um, you know, which the Publishers Weekly list is deeper, but it also shows you the number of copies sold, which I don't believe the New York Times does. Yeah, uh, and and also, you know, we've all heard stories of uh, authors and publishers trying to game the system, um, which involves uh, you know buying up. Uh, copies of your own book um, and I think the New York Times is uh, getting wise to those ways and that's one of the reasons why um, sometimes titles that you'd expect to see on there just don't appear well when, you know, one of the things that we did in how to sell a crap load of books and I do I do with with all the authors I ghost for and the authors we market for and I know Aaron does this with his authors is really advise people please 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 do not worry about the bestseller list right because right. they can become so focused on that and obsessed with it that they lose sight of what it takes to have your book be a real success, which is strong, consistent sales over the long term. 
I mean, 99.99% of books, maybe 99.99999% of books have no shot at it. So why obsess over it? I think that's what the, our message is. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that makes a lot of sense. I want to I want to talk to you about so many different things. Um, but but what I I'd like for maybe you to to walk my listeners through maybe from from beginning to up until the boy, uh, up until the point where the book uh, gets published because then we could we could talk for hours and after the marketing of it. So let's say I'm I'm a I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a business person. I feel as though and I've heard this people I've heard people say this before everybody has a bestseller in them. So I I have this idea. I haven't written anything down yet, but I have this concept. How do I start? And and what's the process really like from okay, uh, here, day 1? How long does it usually take? I think a lot of people need to hear this stuff um in, in really what it takes. But so day 1, I got an idea. I think I can I been thinking about it for a while. I decided I want to write a book. Where do I start? So, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here if I could. You want to jump in? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, sure. So um, I get asked that question all the time. And um, the first thing I ask an author is, is the book written? And if it's just a great idea, I advise them to do one thing. Create a one-page synopsis of what it is. What are you writing? What's the big deal? Who's going to care? And once we get that, then the next thing I question them, uh, next thing I ask them is, are you in fact going to write this book? And if the answer is yes, then um, you know they go on their way and write the book. And if the answer is no, then we talk about alternatives, including ghostwriters, quality ghostwriters. And so that's where um, you know people like Tim come in. And maybe Tim, you want to pick it up from that point and then throw it back to me when we get into the uh, the publishing pieces. Sure. Um, well, you know, the other question uh, when it comes to ghosting is, is the book fiction or nonfiction? Because fiction and ghostwriting is quite rare, you know, unless you're James Patterson or somebody like that who has a team of ghosts to write his novels. Um, well, all, the, all, the, all the ghosting I do is nonfiction, and most ghostwriters will say the same. So it's self-help and memoir and things like that. There's not a lot. There, there is fiction ghosting out there, but it's, it's maybe 10% of the ghostwriting world. Um, so if someone is going to work, is going to ghost their book, then, um, the first thing to do, of course, is find a good ghostwriter. That's, that's, you know, not necessarily the easiest thing to do. I don't want to go too deeply into that because that's a whole different topic. Um, but let's say you have your ghostwriter, you know, one of the, the key questions to ask there, um, or you're, you're seeking one. Let's talk, let's talk about that. Um, you know, you want to ask about the person's experience, see the books they've written, um, and, you know, sales are not as important. I mean, you want to see you know, good, good quality books. I've, done, I've written a lot of books um, that either were never published, uh, were self-published and sold 100 copies because the author lost interest. doesn't mean they weren't good books. It just mean, means the, you know, the author dropped the ball or in some cases the market said, we don't like this. Um, I did a book for a celebrity who I won't name um, two weeks before her. It was a great book, terrific book. Uh, uh, Two weeks before her book came out, she she humiliated herself on national television, and that destroyed the sales of her book. So, you want to talk to your ghost about experience, get some references, see the quality of their work, and see how they find out how they manage the project. So, are they going to simply take dictation, or are they going to add value to the work? So, let's say you're doing a nonfiction book again. Fiction is a different animal. Um, you, you, as the author, might have an idea and you may have been holding on to this idea for two or three or five or ten years it, it, however it might not be the best idea to, to be the foundation of your book based on um, the market that you're shooting for you might need a, a ghostwriter to come in and say okay well I, I understand your idea what if we did this variation on that idea not all ghostwriters will do that some will just take dictation and write exactly what you tell them and to me, that's not really serving the author. Um, a good ghost is someone who brings not just writing to the table, but, but creative thinking, concept work, knowledge of the market, understanding of how best to get the message across. And it may not be the exact idea the author brings to the table. Uh, I do that most of the time, where I come to, the, to my writers and say, uh, well, that's the way I understand your idea. Now let's, let's tweak it a little bit. Let's, let's, put it in, let's frame it in a different way. Um, then beyond that, it's really about structure, uh, outlining. It's a, a very interview-based process. Most ghosts are going to ask to interview their do long, extensive interviews with their authors, 
and um, the whole process, you know, can take. Um, I'd say the average time from you know from first sit down to having a first draft is probably six to eight months. Maybe longer for a more complex book. Um, I've had books that took two years, but I'd say six to eight months is probably from the first time you sit down with somebody saying, "All right, you're my ghostwriter. I want to write a book. Let me tell you what my idea is." To here's your finished first draft. Figure six to eight months because there's planning, there's outlining, there's interviewing, then there's writing. Um, and then that's when I turn it over to somebody like Naren and say, okay, here's the first draft. Go do your thing. So what that first? I, I was going to, I was going to ask the question, but you didn't, I didn't even need to. Yeah. So, so where do we go from here? So now we got this first draft. We feel, we feel like, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely, uh, worthy of being published, uh, because we worked with, uh, someone like Tim from the very beginning. So I'm not, a, I'm not an author by trade, but I've been working with Tim the whole time. Uh, and then we go to to you, Naren, who's who's published thousands of books, uh, and you say yes. How long does it take from there, and what do I need to do to get it to the point where it, where I actually can hold that physical copy in my hand? So I've worked with authors um, back on the uh, the timeline question that uh, wrote their own books in two months. I've worked with authors that wrote their own book in twenty years. So it really is um, all over the place. Um, so we get a script. And either it's been ghostwritten or the author has written the, written the book. The first thing we do is send it for editorial. Um, and there's different levels of uh, editing, of course, uh, developmental, copy, line editing, or a simple proofread. Now, depending on the size of the manuscript, that typically takes about a month's time to do it right. And again, um, sometimes we'll work with authors that, uh, you know, they say the script is fine. It's even, even after working with a ghostwriter. I'm um, actually, Tim and I are working on a project right now, and he did a great job writing the script, but we still got it over to an edit- editor. And that's how important editorial is. Um, so that process typically takes a month. And while that's going on, um, we, we start working on something that's really important, and that's the cover design. Um, everyone's heard that saying you can't judge a book by its cover well in this industry you absolutely can and people do Um, cover and interior design um, we typically a lot two or three weeks and that is um, a lot of back and forth between the author uh, our editorial team and uh, I've worked on covers that have gone really smoothly I've worked on covers that have taken three months with maybe 30 or 40 different revisions um, so that again is probably another on average, let's say another month process, the interior design. So editorial a month, um, cover design and interior design a month, that's two months. And to print a book, it takes about a month and a half, maybe a month if everything goes smoothly. So there we are, you know, we're looking at three months from the time Tim hands over a beautiful manuscript to the time where we have a book in hand. Now authors get Super excited when they hear they're going to have a, a book in their hands to hold, smell, touch um, in three months. And we have to sort of remind them that book in hand is different than a release date. Now, you guys on the call know what that means. Um, book in hand is when you have a book, of course, that you can hold. The release date is the date that it becomes generally available. Um, the longer you can take um, to do the things like introduce uh, to buyers – um, get it set up for online sales. Um, the the longer that period, the better. Generally, Barnes and Noble, for example, you know they like to have six to nine months between the time they know about a book till the time it's available. Now, that's not really practical in in many instances, but at a minimum, what I tell people is let's give it a good three months from the time we have the book to the time we release the book. And during that time, there's a lot of important things that happen. That makes a lot of sense. In a minute, I want to ask you uh, what, uh, how important is the title in just a minute. Folks, we are on with Naren Ariel and Tim Vandehey. They are the uh, co-founders of, of, a, of a company called Beast Sellers. They, they, they've taken their years and years of experience both in the publishing world and in the writing world and also in the marketing world within, within what we're talking about here, selling books, and they've created BeastSellers.com. I'm going to talk a little bit more 
about what they do and how they do it. But if you've had an idea for a book, maybe you've written a book and it's not really doing anything or you don't know what to do with it. Or maybe you've written a book and you, you want to submit it to a publisher. It doesn't really matter what stage you're in. Um, you know, I know we have a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of business people that listen to this podcast. And I know a lot of you have said, hey, man, I, I have a book. I want to write a book. Well, you know, if you're listening right now, this is your opportunity to get some more information. It's free information. You can just go to beastsellers.com. They have a blog. You can just also put in your information. You can submit an idea, uh, in, you know, in and they'll get back with you. Um, you can also find their book right on Amazon. It's called How to Sell a Crap Load of Books. Again, it's an interesting title. It's got, it makes me laugh. It's kind of a funny title. And that leads me into the question, uh, Naren, of, you know, we were talking about the cover design of the book a, a minute ago. How important is the title? And before you answer, um, you know, for both of my books, my first two books, um, Ask More, Get More, and 5% More, I had those titles. I was in love with them, and the publisher loved them, and they just, they, it just kind of clicked. And, and I've written a third book with, um, with Wiley and Sons, and uh, it took us a long time uh, to 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 come up with the title. Uh, and and we finally, if we we you know, there were titles that I just didn't like, and then there was some that I really did like that they didn't like. And you know, how important is the title? Uh, it's very important. How's that for an answer? Um, That's great. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> here's here's the thing, right? I mean, sometimes authors will fall in love with the title, and what I tell them is. Um, Okay, so you love it, great. The real question is, is it gonna resonate with your target market? That's the critical question. And so sometimes, um, you know, the, the subtitle is almost as important as the title as well. Right. And, and so again, is it gonna resonate with the target market? It's all about the target market. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. You know, one of the other things that I wrote down as we were talking through um, is brand. You know, we always hear so much what, you know, the importance of your brand, of your personal brand. And for me, again, my my two books, Ask More, Get More, and 5% More, have really increased my public profile and my brand and helped build, you know, legitimacy in, in you know, not only what I do or, or what I'm also trying to do. Um, tell us about, you know, uh, Beast Sellers as it relates to helping with people's brand? Because I think that's what's really happening. I don't know, maybe maybe I'm wrong. I think that's really happening a lot in the in this world with, with the self-publishing. People can pump out a, a book, you know, in a few hours if they wanted to. Um, tell me how B-Sellers helps uh, people, you know, enhance their brand or even create a brand through the, the publishing world. I'm going to do this one, Darren. Fire away. If I could just say one more thing about uh, the title. Um, one practical consideration that I think is important. Sometimes people go on to Amazon, for example, and will just type some words and then you know see what books come up. So keep that in mind when you're determining you know what a suitable title is for your book. Yeah, I mean that's a great that's a great point because one of the I had a couple I uh, for for my third book I wanted to call it Organized Chaos. I just loved the. I saw it once at a at a at a playland that my daughter was at, and, and I just and I and I refer to my business here as we call it organized chaos. I'm like, what a great title! And I got on Amazon. There's a million books out there called Organized Chaos. So yeah, that, that, you're right. That's very important, you know. And and Naren, you as an attorney in the corporate world, and myself that comes from the corporate world, and both we both understand intellectual property and trademark and copyright. Um, the, it, there, it, that that title, when you say it's very important, uh, it's not only very important from the marketing side, but it's also very important from the intellectual property standpoint side. If you have a title that infringes on someone else's, I had a, this guy just wrote a book called. Ask More, Frank Cessno is his name, right? And I have a book called Ask More, Get More, which I have trademarks on, right? But you know you can't trademark the title of the book. So there's a lot of different things that you need to consider uh, with that title in addition to the marketing. And me as an attorney and you as an attorney as well, I'm hypersensitive uh, to the intellectual property side of it and being able to protect what is now what we're talking about, your brand. Yeah, and, and we could talk more about this. Um, you know, there are other considerations, right? Like, is the URL available? Right. Is your Facebook handle available? Is the Twitter available? I mean, these are all considerations that uh, must go in um, on the front end uh, of this decision-making process. I agree with you 100%. I think that's sound advice. That, that's not, that's, that, that not only relates to books, but, uh, but anything, anything you're trying to sell. But, yeah, if you have a great book and you have a title uh, and, and you fell, fell in love with it and then you find that someone else has that title or that URL – you might want to reconsider changing the name of the book because you know we're going to talk now about the brand and the marketing side of it, which I, again, when we talked about earlier, I believe 
is the most difficult part. Right, so yeah, definitely pay attention to that again. You can just go to bsellers.com. I mean, again, Naren's an attorney by trade. I know we we got to be careful we're not giving legal advice, but he understands, you know, the legal world. Tim obviously understands the writing of the world, the publishing world. He's written, you know, he's written books and ghostwritten books that have gone gone on to be, become New York Times bestsellers. So he's seen it all as well. He's a, he's been he was a copywriter in his past, so he understands copyright, trademark, the whole thing. Um, so again, just go to bsellers.com, and, and if you have questions, you can they'll they'll answer, you know you can just put in your information there, and they can get back to you. So um, we're, we're talking about the brand part of it again. Um, how, do, how can B sellers help and, and how does writing a book help people's brands? Well, you know, the, 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 I learned about the importance of branding when I wrote the brand called You, which, you know, I said was the was a self-published book that took off that really started my career. And actually, we, we flipped that book to McGraw-Hill five years later. So it actually came out with a, a big New York house. And I spent 10 years doing branding in at the ad agency environment and as a freelancer before I started writing books. So I got to, you know, that was one of the things that I started really looking at when I started having, because what I would do is I would finish a manuscript. My work's pretty much done. My authors would go off, they would go seek a publishing deal, they would go look to self-publish, and in the process of doing that, they would look for marketing help, they would look for publicists, they would look for speakers bureaus, things like that. They would come back to me and say, and I, not all of them, but some of them would call me three months later or something and say, I cannot find anybody who is not going to uh, who doesn't who doesn't want to charge me a fortune and offer me no real help at all, um, or take a piece of my sales and things like that. And nobody was offering authors branding help. But what I mean by that is, writers, whether they're fiction or nonfiction, they're so focused on the writing. Most most writers, are, I can't say all of them, but the the great majority, they're so focused on the writing that they ignore a very simple but very important question. How do I get people to read my book? Most people don't enter the, the field of publishing with any sort of fame or any sort of big name. And they, most writers completely overlook that as they move toward becoming published authors. So one of the principles that we put in How to Sell a Crap Load of Books, and it's one of the things that we have made central to the beast seller's approach, which is a huge amount and you can probably back this up, Mike, with, with what you've gotten from your books. A huge amount of the publicity and speaking and other opportunities you're going to get from your book are passive. They are going to come about not because of an email that you sent or a press release you mailed out or a tweet or a Facebook post or anything else. They're going to come about because somebody stumbles across your book or your website and goes, wow. Or, or they get a referral. That's another very common one. And they're going to, so they, they have no input from you at all. And they're going to look at your book cover and they're going to look at your website and say either, wow, this person is a pro, this person is a player. If it's non, if it's fiction, this person looks like they take the craft seriously. You know, there's so much, the packaging is so important. Or they're going to look at your terrible website that you designed in a half an hour on WordPress at your kitchen table and say, this person's an amateur. I'm not going to waste my time. Uh, on their book, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. So a lot of opportunities come or are lost. And of course, if, you, if they're lost, you never know about them as the author. You never know about the opportunities you don't get. Because people come into contact with an author's brand, and it's either polished and professional. It gives the person in, lots of information. It gives an easy contact path. It makes the writer look like a player, look like a serious publishing professional. Or it makes the writer look like a hack. And our goal was to say, every writer, I don't care what their, what their book is, what their budget is, deserves to look like a pro. That's going to help them. And that was, that's one of the cornerstones of what we do, is build that brand so that when, people, when, when readers, um, podcast hosts, other members of the media, anybody come into contact with the, with the author's brand, they are impressed. They want to know more. They don't turn away and say, this is just another self-published person whose work is probably not worth reading. So that is a big, big part of what we do, and it's a big, big part of what a lot of authors ignore. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I know you guys don't have a lot more time. We've we've, we've been on for a good uh, forty minutes, so I could keep I could just keep picking your brains because I, I, I get excited about talking to experts that really know things uh, better than I do. So um, here's a question: a question I, I get asked all the time, and one of the questions I think about, uh, and some people have reached out to me and asked me this question: um, should I should I self publish a book, or should I or should I go out and find a real publishing house? And, and I say real, there's a lot of different versions of it, but should I self-publish or have it published by a publishing house? 
What are your opinions on that, and and why should someone go one way or the other? So I'll take that. So um, you know, the truth of the matter is, ninety nine point nine percent of the writing public is not going to get a book deal from one of the big five uh, publishing houses in New York. So. Um, that's just a reality, and that's just a knock, not necessarily a knock on the content, the quality of the content, or the person. Um, um, it's just it's just a reality. So, um, you know, so you got to understand that the odds are stacked against the person that has not written a book before and doesn't have a massive following um, uh, to begin with. So um, that's just a reality that uh, some authors don't like to hear. And if they're still really... Uh, passionate about their project, there are some options. Um, you know, you asked early on what it takes to publish, and the the you know the the answer to that question is you know frankly not a lot. Anybody can um, get their book and upload it onto Amazon CreateSpace, and voila, you are published. So you know what what are you trying to accomplish? That's that's the question that I would get back to for the ninety nine percent of others that uh, aren't going to get a New York um, deal. Yeah, you know, I, I you know I asked a question. You know, as lawyers, we we ask questions that we always think we know answers to. And for me, when I was going, because when people, I said the same thing. It all depends on what you want to accomplish. But for me, who uh, you know, who is an entrepreneur, I own you know businesses. I've you know been been at it for a little while. Um, it, there's a legitimacy factor there, right? Um, but then also, the, like when you you know when you like your company, Mascot or or, or Wiley, like I have been with in Greenleaf. Um, you guys have contacts that we do not have. Uh, if you're going to publish as as an author, if you're going to if you're going to self publish a book, like the buyers at Barnes and Noble, like the buyers at at independent stores that are becoming in- increasingly even more important, um, like contacts at Books a Million and all these other things, right? I mean, that's for me. Yeah. I, the, the the distribution network for me, uh, I think, is is crucial, especially if you're really trying to build. Uh, a brand. Yeah, and also I will say this. Um, at Mascot, anyway, what we're looking for is um, authors that have good content that we can add value both in terms of uh, production and distribution. So if you're interested in being not just a creative, creative success but have a real chance to uh, be a financial success with your project, um, those are the type of projects that uh, we're most interested in. And, you know, Mike, the, the question of self-published or not self-published, I run into it all the time working with my with my authors and it is also a question of who is going to get your book to the finish line and do you have time and the resources to do that meaning if you're going to pure, I mean pure self publishing I I recommend it to nobody none of my clients because if you talk pure self publishing that means you are hiring the contractors you are overseeing the printing you are doing everything yourself if you're busy and you're running a company or a medical practice or a university which again, I'm, that's that's a lot of the people I'm de- that I'm working with. You don't have the time to do that. Not only do you not have the time to do that, you don't have the expertise to do that. And there are many, many, many more steps in producing a professional quality book, something that looks like it rolled off the line from one of the big, the big five in New York, than people realize. And every one of those steps is an opportunity not only to screw things up but to waste a lot of money. So. I, so I tell people, this, treat your book like a business. And if it's not a business that you know how to run, why on earth would you publish it yourself? Why, and and, and Naren's Naren's right. Going out and getting a deal from a Macmillan or a HarperCollins is not in the cards for most people because they simply don't have the marketing platform to do it. So there, there fortunately, there is an ecosystem of independent publishers. You mentioned Greenleaf. Obviously, uh, Naren's got Mascot. There is a huge ecosystem of independence that can do all that stuff for you in a very reasonable time frame um, and get your book out. So you don't have to, they're, they're professionals at it. They've got the contacts, as you said, they've got the, the vendors, they know the business. There's absolutely no reason to self-publish. I think, especially for someone who's, who's busy and doing the book as a professional, um, part, of the, part of their professional branding, uh, there's no reason to self-publish. You know, we could have a podcast that is uh, all about publishing pitfalls. And, you know, we've been at this since uh, 2003. And, you know, honestly, looking back at some of our very early titles, um, we fell into some of those pitfalls. And what's happened over the years is, you know, we've produced, we've, we've learned how to produce beautiful books and we've learned how to, to distribute them. And so if you want to do this on your own and, and sort of fall into those traps that we did 10, 15 years ago, 
um, that's a risk. Yeah, I think it's uh, sound advice. You know, I wrote down, I say this all the time, I say the best experiences are the experiences of other people. And, and I also like to say, you know, I know enough to know that I don't know. And I think so many people kind of forget that. So, um, guys, I know we're running out of time. I don't know what that, that ding was in the back. I think someone has a chicken in, in the oven or something. But <laughs> but I, I want to thank you so much for your time. You know, again, if you've been listening right now uh, and you're interested, again, in, in writing a book or maybe you have a book and uh, maybe you just have the idea and, and you don't know where to go. I mean, we, I'm glad that we kind of ended the podcast with this. These guys are experts. They're professionals. I actually work with Naren with my – with my book that I published with my daughter. We'll give a little plug called Peanut Butter and Toast. Right now it's the number one release, uh, new release, and it was number one in a bunch of categories already. And so these guys, you know, know, know what they're doing, both Naren and Tim. And it also, if you just want to, you know, learn more a little bit about them, you just go to beastsellers.com. But they do also have a great book. And, and the title, we talked a little bit about the importance of a title from a marketing standpoint. You can, ju- you can just go to Amazon, and their book is, is called How to Sell a Crap Load of Books, 10 Secrets of a killer author marketing platform. This is their experiences. These guys have, have been involved in thousands of books, uh, and they've been doing it you know, for, for a long time. So again, if you want some more information about them and what they're doing at B-Sellers, just visit them at bestellers.com. Again, my name is Michael Alden, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. The preceding episode was brought to you by Cloisonne, one of the world's fastest growing network marketing companies. With our life-changing products and our revolutionary Try It For Free It's On Me campaign, we are changing how people make money from home. So if you're interested in helping people improve their health and their wealth by giving away products for free, then visit cloisonne.com. That's C-L. O-I-X-O-N-N-E dot com. Cloisonne's easy as one, two, three system is helping the average everyday person earn a significant income just by showing others how to give away life-changing products for free. So visit cloisonne.com. That's C-L-O-I-X-O-N-N-E dot com. Start changing your own health and your own wealth today.